Hi, I'm Exo, and the question that comes up every month or so on the uh, Discord is, how did Exodus start? Um, so I figured we'd do a video about it, and uh, next time someone asks, I can just paste the link instead of typing it all up again. Back uh, around 2005, uh, maybe 2006, I was, uh, I had an evening off, I worked night shift at the time, and, um, I thought, you know what, I haven't played Discworld in a long time. And when I initially played Discworld, uh, it's an adventure game based on the Terry Pratchett book series, it was on the PlayStation, uh, believe it or not. Not the most conducive way to play a point-and-click adventure. No mouse. Uh, there is a PlayStation mouse, and I believe it is even compatible with that game. I did not own the PlayStation mouse. So I had my PS1 controller, and this is before the DualShock. Discworld was... Uh, it was not a launch title, but it was one of the early ones. Uh, for those of you who collect or are familiar with or had PlayStation 1 games, the initial ones came in long boxes. Um, there. <laughs> uh, whereas later ones came in the CD case that we know uh, and most games came in for a long time after that, uh, before we moved to DVD cases. The long box cases are unique. Uh, they had large manuals. They were more reminiscent of a, of a PC game in that way. Uh, I don't remember the exact year that Discworld came out, but because it was in a long box, I know it was one of the first ones. So, no DualShock controller yet. You did have the analog sticks, though. And, um, no, I'm wrong. You didn't have analog sticks, because that's what DualShock meant. It was just the D-pad when the PS1 first came out. Man, it's been a long time. It's hard to remember PlayStation controllers that didn't have uh, the dual analog sticks. So yes, you had to use the directional pad to move the mouse cursor around the screen. And then when you moved over something you could use, it would animate. And you could hit the uh, use button, an action button that would pull up what you wanted to do to it. If you wanted to get something out of your inventory, you had to move the little cursor down to this walking luggage that would follow you around and click on him and... Then it would show you what was inside. You'd move up to the thing you wanted to use and move it over. A very tedious way of playing the game. Now, uh, this is a bit of a side tangent, but the PS1 did have adventure games on it. More than you would expect, which is, I think I'd expect none. Uh, another one that comes to mind is, uh, what was it? Burning Dragons? Oh, see, I don't prepare for these videos at all. I just start talking. Um, I'm going to think about it while I'm talking, but... That one did recently come up as uh, a game that is now emulatable using ScumVM. So now it's not locked to your PlayStation. It was odd in that it didn't have a PC port. Um, Burning Dragons? It's going to come to me. It's Burning something. It had John Cleese in it. It had, uh, which was interesting because you had Eric Idle doing the voice of Rincewind over in Discworld. Uh, Cheech Marin. Several main voices were in the Dragon game that I'm talking about for the PS1. Uh, and if I don't think about it before, I'm looking this way because all my PS1 games are stacked over here. And I, I can't read the covers from here, but I was hoping that um, that uh, if I looked that way, I would get the idea. You know what? I'm going to go look. I'll be right back. I have returned, and now I'm prepared. Uh, I was not Burning Dragons. It was Blazing Dragons. Uh, and it was not John Cleese. It was Terry Jones. So, see, I'm... I know enough to be dangerous about a lot of things, uh, not enough to be a historian that can talk off the top of his head without doing a little research first. But Blazing Dragons is surprisingly a game that um, never got a PC release, which is crazy because it's a point-and-click adventure that came out in the heyday of point-and-click adventures. I don't understand why they didn't do a PC release. I, it also says uh, Harry Shearer is in here, uh, famous from The Simpsons. Uh, and several other... It, it's, a, it's a funny game. Definitely, seemingly, inspired by Discworld. And this is the long box I was talking about. Um, these boxes were a lot more tangible. And uh, when you open these guys up here... you got to crack them open. There we go. You had a nice... Flip my disc the right way there. Nice little inside there. you got a printed thing behind the disc. You've got a really nice size manual in here. These are cool games. Uh, I've got Resident... I've got a... Di I think I've got almost every long box game released over there. Uh, Resident Evil 1 was a long box game initially, before the director's cut came out. Anyway, I am so far off tangent, I apologize. I'm here to tell you how Exodus got started. And it all got started because I played this. 
1995 or 96, somewhere in there. And in 2006 or, or 5, somewhere in there, I wanted to play it again, and now I had the PC version. I had the big box copy. I did not bring it with me, and I don't feel like pausing it and running across my house to go grab it just to show it. Um, and I knew about DOSBox. I had used it here and there to make small games work, but I had never, like, imaged a CD, taken the BINQ or the ISO, mounted it, installed it. I hadn't done all that before. And in 05, 06, uh, DOSBox was still pretty rudimentary. There were still a lot of games that didn't run at full speed. There were uh, The compatibility level was not super, super high, but it had a lot of promise, and it was the closest thing you had. I mean, it was the only DOS emulator at the time. I don't think PCEM existed yet at that time. And, I mean, it, it needs a powerful machine today. I can't imagine what it needed back, what it would have needed back then if it had existed. Um, the short of it is, I had a hell of a time getting Discworld running. I was on the Vogons forums. I started asking questions. I was accused of being a pirate right off the bat. Rule zero, no abandonware. Uh, I remember taking a picture of my disc and writing my name next to it and being like, is this good enough proof for you? Can you help me now? But uh, that didn't do, do me any good because then it just uh, derailed the entire thread into um, I was rude in the way I corrected them that uh, I owned the game. Uh, it was the first of many bad tastes in my mouth about the way those forums are run. Um, and I get it. They're trying to protect themselves, but there's a difference between being protecting yourself from copyright content and being an outright dick to people that come on there to ask questions. Um, people wouldn't be coming there if they didn't have questions. There's only two reasons you hang out on a place like that. One, you know, you think you know it all or you enjoy being around people who think they know it all. And you've been around long enough that now it's become a social circle for you. Or you're going to get information. That's why you're there. You're trying to find something out. You're looking up something. And that's the main reason you're going to be at a technical forum. Is you need to find out something. So, as so often happens with these forums, a very small group of people become gatekeepers. And their entire self-worth is based around how many people a day they can tell to, uh, you know, read the fact. Um, you broke a rule. It gets ridiculous. And I'm back again because uh, I had my doorbell ring and I had a very busy weekend. And so now it's been three or four days since I was initially recording the video on uh, the origin of Exodus. So I caught up on where I was. And um, the short story on the forum thing is it was important to me when I started the Exodus Discord to not have this gatekeeping mentality to have a place where people could come in ask questions and as long as they're being respectful we're all good now i'm also not very tolerant for folks who come in with entitled sensibilities uh, but we don't run them off immediately we try to let everyone know hey this is a chill place a laid-back place um but the reason i tell that story is because i sat there after getting discworld working finally uh spending all night working on it and not getting a lot of help from the Vogons forum where DOSBox was uh, hosted at. And my first thought was, okay, I don't want to do this again. I don't want to lose a whole night to trying to get a game set up and then never get to play it. So I'm just going to go to my shelf of adventure games, pull them all down, and set them all up. And I'll put them in a little front end, and I can browse them and play them at my leisure. At the time, the front end I picked up was called Mala, M-A-L-A. -A. I don't even know if that's around anymore, but it was a little front end that was fairly customizable, but really bare bones. And I put in 75, 80 adventure games that I owned at the time. Got them all working, DOS adventure games. And then at that point, that led me to think, okay, well, if I've got these running, what, what am I missing? So then I started... I must have spent a year on eBay just buying adventure games, just trying to fill up my collection. Um, there used to be a website called Underground Gamer that I was a member of. And I got on the forums one day and I saw people talking about like, well, I'm going to post my collection of, you know, oh, Sailor Moon games or whatever. And there's, there's four games in the set. I'm going to post my collection of Sonic games and there's 10 games in the set. And... I thought, well, maybe I should do like a, a King's Quest pack or something. And then I thought, well, 
maybe I could do like a Sierra pack. I could just upload all the Sierra games. And there was one of those later, but there wasn't one yet. And then I thought, well, what if I just did an adventure pack? And so I asked people if anyone would be interested in that. And uh, quite a few people said, yeah, I'd love to have an adventure pack of DOS games. Now, around this time, a user that went by Donorumo posted a screenshot of a front end that he was working on for himself that he had coded in Moreland, I believe, called Meager. And I, it stood for, it wasn't, it stood for something, and I don't remember what it stood for anymore. But um, I'll have to ask him next time I talk to him online. Um, he posted it and said, hey, here's a front end that I made. Uh, if anyone wants to use it, here's a download for it. Uh, I hope someone finds use for it. And I saw that and I thought, this looks pretty good. And his demo uh, game he had in the screenshot was King's Quest IV. So I thought, oh, okay. And, you know, it's very distinct cover. I happen to have this sitting here because uh, I was talking with someone online about the AGI copy the other day. But Rosella on the back of the unicorn there, the wing guy coming at her. Like, that's a really distinct. It, it jumps out at you. It's really good art. And happens to be my first King's Quest game I ever played, so I have a lot of nostalgia for it. And I saw that meager thing, and I thought, I'm going to reach out to the guy. Well, I ended up hijacking it. It ended up becoming the de facto front end. To this day, I have people asking me if I can make Exodus compatible with meager again, because they prefer it to LaunchBox due to its simplicity. But also, it has some features in it that we never, I've never seen in another uh, front end. One of my favorites was... Right now, if you go to, uh, like, LaunchBox or any front end for that matter, uh, GameX, uh, Hyperspin, let's say you pull up a game like The Perils of Rosella, King's Quest IV. Well, if you've got a really big collection of games in there, you could have the Amiga copy, the Commodore 64 copy, the Apple II copy, I think Atari ST might have had a version for it, then you've got the IBM PC version of it, um... And then some games that came out later, like King's Quest V, there was like the IBM floppy version, the IBM CD version, the Nintendo NES version. Uh, I think there might have been, I'm sure there were some other versions too. I think Amiga had it too. Well, each one ends up getting its own entry and they're all separate from each other. So you either have to go by platform and then go find your game or you search all your games, but then you get like five copies of King's Quest IV come up. In Meager, we had this really cool feature where you could click on a game like King's Quest IV and it was one unified entry. And there was a list of all the platforms it was for that you had in your front end. And so like King's Quest VI, you had a DOS version and you had a Windows 3X version. The Windows 3X version actually has different graphics in it. There's high-res character portraits when, you, uh, when you're when you talking to people. And so if you clicked on the Windows 3X platform, the cover changed, the description changed, the screenshots changed, the release information changed to the Windows 3X release date, not the DOS release date. And now if you launch the game, that was the version you would get. But if you wanted to check out a different copy, a different platform uh, port, you would just click on that and it would switch the whole screen to that one. And I love that unification. I love the idea of one each game having a single source, but then from in that single source, you can browse all the different releases. I think that a lot of front ends kind of approach it backwards, in my opinion. They Everything is split by platform. And... That's great if all you if, if you're platform focused, but if you're coming at it from a game focus like I do, I want to see like I want to type in King's Quest and see every King's Quest game that ever came out, and then from there I want to go to any one of those games and see every platform that that game ever got ported to, and then I want to be able to click through them and see the screenshot differences, see a video snap difference, read about oh this is published by a different person than that one, or wow this one came out four years after that one did, because it's all in one place. I don't know. I love that feature. Back to where we were. Uh, I put out an adventure pack eventually. I think I had about 300 games in the first release of Exodus. It was Exodus Adventure, is what I called it. And um, the Exodos came to me. I was looking for a name. I went by Exo. It was a DOS game. And it just, like, I sat there one day and it was like, Exo and DOS, Exodos, Ex Exodos. It just, that sounds great. <laughs> I couldn't have thought of that better. Um... Uh, it worked out very well, and I like the way it, it fit. So I called it that, and I was delusional. I, In my mind, I thought, I've done it. I have <laughs> released, and I wasn't thinking about preservation at this time. 
I was just thinking about making it easy to play old games for people that didn't know how to. And screw the guys over at the Bogons forums. Uh, I was going to help people do it if they weren't going to. I was going to do it myself if they weren't going to help people do it. Uh, DOS for dummies. But not that anyone who uses my pack is a dummy, but you don't have to be super talented or you don't have to do research to like run a DOS game with Exodus. It just works. <laughs> kind of sounds like Apple, right? I'm not a big fan of Apple myself, but I, 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 if something just works, I think that's a great mantra. Um, I thought I did it. I was like, 300 games. Adventure's done. Uh, uh, no, there were so many more I didn't realize. Uh, now I did it, and in my post-packaging bliss, I decided, well, that was easy. I should do another uh, genre. And I asked for a vote. I said, what, what genre do you think I should tackle next, guys? And they said, RPGs, everybody. Very, almost universally, RPG. Like, okay, cool. So I go to Moby Games, I type in DOS, RPG, a couple hundred games going, a couple hundred games, that's doable, no problem. So, meanwhile, I'm, I'm, I'm patching and fixing all these games from uh, Exodus Adventure that I had released. So when I fix those patches, I'm like, all right, well, Exodus Volume 1 Adventure, and then I did Exodus Volume 2 RPG. Well, I knocked that out. Uh, and by now, I've got a method, so it goes quicker for me. And... From there, I kept adding more packs. The third one was strategy games. Now, by this time, I'm aware. The big elephant in the room is action. Doom. FPS games. Like, these are the games that everyone's waiting for at this point. And so I thought, well, then those will be last. Because if I do them first, everyone gets that and they move on and they don't care anymore. And so with strategy out of the way, that left, like, the, the random stuff, in my opinion. So I, I called it the Sports Sims... Uh, sports simulation pack uh, and so you had racing games in there you had simulation games like uh, SimCity and such and you had all the, the various sports titles in there and I you know I actually had a lot of fun doing that pack I didn't expect because there's so many kind of hidden gems I, I didn't have a lot of experience with those kind of games finally with that done um, I released or started working on to release Exodus Volume 5 Action I still remember sitting in the hospital in 2013 when my son was being born, working on the release cover for Exodus Volume 5, um, doing like taking the uh, the font logo style of Doom and, and trying to rewrite it uh, to say Exodus you know, by cutting and pasting pieces of it. Uh, so I can date it very specifically. So it took me from about 2006 to 2013 to put out the first five volumes of Exodus. Now, during that time, I, I kept versioning up the numbers. I got to strategy, and I was like, well, now we're at Exodus 2, version 2, volume 1. Version 2, volume 2. Version 2, volume 3. By the time I got to action, I had changed the back so much that that, I went and revamped volumes 1 through 4, then released volume 5, and I put them all out as version 3. Uh, when I finished version 3 in 2013, I was pretty burned out on Exodus, so I went ahead and quit at that point for a year. I just took a year off, but in that time, I started working on Windows 3X. And so all of 2013, the rest of it, uh, 2014 and half of 2015, I spent working on Windows, uh, ExoWin 3X is what I called it at the time. Or no, I tried to call, I tried to be fancy, I tried to call it Win 3 xo and take the three and reverse it, make it an E, so it looked like WinXO. No one got it. No, it, just, it didn't fly. People didn't get the, the reference I was trying to go for. So I gave up trying to be clever and just started calling it XO Win 3X at that point. Um, well, I had a lot of ideas for Exodus, but I was getting a little tired of the forums that I was stuck on. And I saw Discord come up. So I thought, you know, like, one of my favorite parts about working on Exodus was sharing stories about DOS games with people, talking to like-minded folks about it. And I found forums to be kind of stifling for that. It was hard to have an actual conversation because it turned into a wall of text, wall of text, wall of text. And there's only so many people that are willing to engage in wall of text conversations. So I started a Discord and called it Exodus, and it was pretty small. And I posted a link out on a Pleasure Dome at the time, which is uh, an old emulation site that's no longer around. Uh, the site's not around. They're, the guys are still around. They're still one of the best places to get like a main pack from. But uh, 
I was really surprised by how quickly people joined. I went from, you know, day one, we went from myself being the only member to a couple hundred people. And uh, over the next month or two, we quickly got to a thousand people. It was really stunning how fast the community grew. And what I did not expect was how many people joined that wanted to assist. And suddenly Exodus was no longer something that I did for five, six, seven hours a day in my spare time while I was doing stuff at work and I was waiting for things to process, I'd turn around and work on it a little bit. Suddenly it was something that was a community project and the quality was through the roof suddenly because before it was like, all right, I got to find the games. I got to add games. I got to find the metadata for the game. Okay. I got it all running. Oh crap. I should look for manuals. Well, I don't have time to look for manuals. I just need to get the release done. So I had scattered manuals. I had scattered things I had found myself, but it was really too much for one person to do all by themselves. And as people started showing up and giving me ideas, version four began and version four was a, the beginning of the community effort. It was people coming in and saying, Hey, what about the Roland MT32 or sound canvas fluid fonts? What about, you know, it was all these ideas being pitched at me. And some of them I was like, no, that's impossible. Like remote m multiplayer. We can't do that. That's it can't, it's no way to automate that configuration. And then one day I wake up version four has been out a little bit. And I think, I think I probably could automate uh, remote multiplayer. And so that became a cornerstone of the version five release. Um, ultimately Exodus, the origin of it, if I had to sum it up, it was initially I want to play a game and I can't figure out how to do it. And then it was, okay, I got that game working. I want all my games to be easy to play. And then it was, well, I should share all the work I did with other folks that might want to try these things. And somewhere after that, I realized there wasn't anything else like it. There were people that were dumping games and sharing them. So there, it wasn't like there was no preservation at all. You have archives.org. There's the Total DOS Collection Project. Uh, there, there were, you know, and then sites like oldgames.ru, um, Abandonia. There were sites that were archiving games, but you still had to know how to get them running yourself. And there was also a lot of sites that were sharing games that were bad rips, scene rips. I mean, back in the day, if a game came out on CD-ROM in 1994, that you couldn't really share that online on a dial-up modem. So someone would come along and strip all the video out, strip the audio out, like the sound, the speech, uh, the music maybe, and give you the bare bones game and they'd share it. And that became what started becoming archived in some cases. Uh, some of you have been around a while might remember a website called Home of the Underdogs. And that was an early abandonware website that hosted all kinds of stuff, but they were packed as if they were being shared on dial-up. Now that said, Home of the Underdogs had been around so long that I first found it when I was still on dial-up. <laughs> So it made sense to have games packed uh, like that. But it was like, you know, uh, 10 ARG files, if you ever had to use them, ARG files. Uh, or, you know, multi-volumed uh, RAR files. So the problem becomes, if that's the most common version of the game online, that starts to become the de facto version of the game. So unless a company comes along later and sells a copy of that game, the version you can find online is the rip. So as around version three, version four, we really started making a huge effort to replace all the scene rips out of Exodus with actual legit dumps. Uh, I have spent thousands of dollars rebuying games we already had to get an original CD so I could copy that CD to an image. Uh, on this last, you know, between version five and six, we, I say we, uh, Python was a major driver of it, but we did work together to identify every game that should have CD audio and make sure that the images had CD audio. It's real common for people to dump a game into ISO format. Well, ISO strips out all the, um, the, the audio format if it's not digital on the disc. If it's um, red book audio format where you actually have tracks in a CD player, ISO doesn't capture that. You got to use a bin Q file and the Q tells the emulator or the disc mounting software how to mount that disc and how to assign each track to that portion of this that contains that data. And therefore you can preserve the audio that's on the disc. Preservation happened by accident. It's where we got to. At some point you look up and you realize no one else is preserving the games 
in a playable manner. No one else is putting time into collecting the ephemera around the games with the games. You have the Video Game History Foundation doing an amazing job of collecting magazines and game design documents. But they're kind of, you know, and I'm not criticizing them in any way, but those all that data is divorced from the game itself. The goal with Exodus is to have a complete picture. I can click on it. I can see scans of the game. I can read about the game. I can see who designed it, when it was designed, when it was released. Uh, with, the, with the language packs coming out, I can see what languages it was in. I can read the manual. If there was a soundtrack, I can listen to the soundtrack. If there was magazines about it, I can read about the previews, the reviews, the articles about it, the cheat section. And then at the end of all that, I can double click on the game and I can play it. And not just play it, but I can play it with different sound types. I can play it with different video types. I can play it single player. I can play it multiplayer. Um, that, if I had spent years of my life designing a game, I it would be important to me for that game to be playable, usable, and not just playable in a yeah I can I can I, I can start it. But the full gamut. I mean, people put time into all these different soundtrack types that they wrote for the games. All the different sound card capabilities. All the different weird little features. Uh, you'll find a game that was preserved, but on the disc was like a virtual museum. Uh, the Scroll, for example, has a really cool point-and-click adventure game. But on that game disc is a whole other executable that's a museum that you can launch and, and read about artifacts in the game. And, and It's really neat, but you don't see it preserved. You don't see it when you buy it. If you could buy a copy of the game, I think it might have been sold at Good Old Games at one point. It may still be there. But I don't remember that being a part of the package at the time. Um, it's hard to give the exact origin story of Exodus because it was not a story. It does not have a beginning, a middle, and an end. It has um, an idea. It has a lot of hubris and stubbornness. And then it has um, a middle part of just learning and getting better at this. And um, I have never been one to misrepresent myself as a technical guru. Uh, there are guys on my Discord that know much more about me than about every single sound card type out there. Or the technical things that are happening behind the game. Uh, if I have any technical prowess at all, it's figuring, it's having the stubbornness to keep working on these games and not give up. It's finding the right people to talk to when I need assistance. It is uh, writing batch. I'm good at that. <laughs> I can write batch code all day long. Um, and I think the one thing that I can bring to the project, regardless of how many people are submitting to it and helping me with it in ways that I could never have done myself, is I try to keep a unified vision of what the project should be. Crowdsourced work is invaluable in terms of the amount of progress you can make, but it's also problematic when it's not being guided. I have seen things like the games database where anyone can log in and edit metadata and then someone else comes and approves the edit. And you all have a game that loads up and it's perfect one day and then later on I go to update the metadata and now something's changed. They, someone took Sierra Online, comma, Inc. dot, and change it to Sierra Online. Well, now it's not normalized anymore. Now it doesn't match all my other Sierra games that say Sierra Online, comma, Inc. Period. Um, that's one thing that I do with my packs. I normalize all the data. I make sure it's, it's uniform. Um, you don't have to worry about someone adding a game to the pack and saying, well, this is a vertical, uh, vert vertical shoot-em-up. And then someone else goes and adds a vertical shoot-em-up and calls it a a scrolling shoot -em up because I'm doing it it should all be fairly normalized now I'm a human I make mistakes I'll miss things sometimes but it's not coming from a place of doing it two different ways it's coming from a place of just handling a massive amount of data these days my goal is to continue preserving to continue building and to continue enjoying it to continue playing and talking to people and sharing stories with them and one of my favorite things is to hear about how the pack is nostalgic for people, how it brings back memories. Um, 
how they get to play games with their parents now that they're an adult that their parents once played with them when they were children. How they get to share games that they played as a child with their children now. I think that there is so much power in memory and nostalgia. And it makes it all worth it. The thousands of hours I put in this project are, are they're worth it for that alone and nothing else. The happiness it brings to people. This, this project is not about a data hoarding collection. It's not about saying you have it all. You'll never have it all. No, no one will ever have every DOS game. No one even knows how many DOS games there were because of the homebrew nature of them. Uh, it's about capturing the zeitgeist of an era that is gone where you had AAA developers side by side with the guy down the street making stuff where games were defined by the levels that people made for them not just what they shipped with I mean you can see that a little bit these days with the games like Roblox but it's not quite the same because it doesn't have that DIY nature to it it doesn't feel uh, for me, anyway, as I'm older, maybe it feels that way for my kids. Maybe that'll be what they do. Maybe in 20, 30 years, they will be out there trying to preserve all the weird little Roblox games and Minecraft worlds and uh, maybe the, the, the Fortnite chapters that are now gone that you can't play anymore. Maybe that'll be what they're trying to preserve. For me, it is the world that I retreated to in my teens when I was given my first computer and my dad had passed away and... Computers became a solace for me. It became a hideaway. It became a place where I was good at something. And I could keep learning all the time. And because of bulletin board systems and dial-up modems, I could talk to strangers who taught me even more stuff. And it felt like I was a part of a community. When I did not feel like a part of a community, when I went to school, when I was uh, on the bus, in places like that, I, I didn't feel like I fit in at all. So to this day, when I play a DOS game, it takes me back to a time of, I had no anxiety, I had no discomfort. I was happy. And I was exploring. And I was solving and I was thinking. I was at my best when I was playing these games. Uh, so that's what Exodus means to me. That's what it is to me. And so if I had to define the history of Exodus, it's all those things but it's also whatever you make of it. Exodus doesn't exist if people weren't interested in it, if people didn't want to download it. Um, I wouldn't have continued working on it for all these years if there hadn't been so much appreciation for it. And that's because universally, the two truths of the people who play with Exodus are they either played these games at some point in their life and it has meaning to them, so there's that nostalgia of the past, or they're new explorers and they did not grow up with this stuff, but they're going back to find something that either they, maybe they were alive at the time, but they didn't get a chance to play it. Or maybe they're my son's age, they're 10, 11, 12, 13 years old and they're finding it and they are checking it out. And hey, I, that's awesome. When we get the young kids showing up on the Discord server, I think that's awesome. It's great. Um, there's no, you know, I think that there's a, a typical mentality of like, ah, oh, geez, here come the, here come the, the, the teenager kids to, to ruin the party. And I, uh, I kind of feel the opposite. I feel like it's really cool that they care enough to want to try it, that they're, that they're here, that they're logging in, they're trying to engage. My 10 year old son uh, logged into discord recently and he went to the game submissions channel, no, the, the missing games channel. And he was hell bent. He was going to find a game that we didn't have. And he actually, through Google searching, found a game that we were missing. It was just a Spanish version of an English version. And I thought that was so cool because people ask me all the time, hey, how can I help the project? Hey, how can I help the project? My 10-year-old son didn't ask. He just got on there, read the channels, found a forum that listed things that could be done, and started looking on how he could do something. Um, very proud of him that day. Um, and then he went back to playing soccer outside. <laughs> but uh, when people ask, how can I help the project? I never give them an answer because the way you help is by finding where you where you want to help, what you want to do. Nobody's effective at volunteering when they don't want to do what they're volunteering for. And that's what defines my project is everyone doing what they do is passionate about it, 
They're good at it. They're talented at it. I respect my whole team for all the things that they do and so many of my users on the, on the Discord server and for the things that they have uh, contributed. So that is a very long, meandering answer to the history of Exodus. But it's fitting because it's a very long, meandering project. And even now, 15 years after I started it, it will not surprise me to still be finding ways to improve it and add to it in 15 more years. This is not the end of Exodus. Uh, may not even be the midpoint. I don't know where we are, but I don't see it ever finishing because we will always find ways to improve it, always find games that we're missing, always find suggestions and ideas that make it better. And I think that's what makes it what it is. It's preservation in this case is a living entity. Thank you for joining me on this journey of memory and for listening to all my ramblings and anecdotes. I appreciate it.